My name is Stan Plum. I'm the curator at the Carnegie Museum, and this is the second in our series of lectures. Uh, Diane Porter gave a fine lecture last month up at the museum on uh, birding and the history of birding in Fairfield. And now I'm taking it the next step further. We're going to talk about the Underground Railroad. Um, I was raised in Fairfield and left in 74 when I graduated high school. Fairfield was one of those towns that nothing ever ha exciting happened here. There was no history of this town. It was boring. So I took off. And the older I got, the smarter I got, I guess, or else the more interesting Fairfield got. So uh, upon retirement, I came back and uh, immediately went up to the museum where I had spent my childhood and started talking to uh, Mark Schaefer, the director. And he got me involved in the museum. And then the Parsons College Alumni Association uh, wanted to, they're, they're always interested in doing things to promote the history of Fairfield. So they approached the museum to see what we could do with the Underground Railroad. And I uh, went to the meeting to kind of sit in the back of the bus and see what people were talking about. And uh, well, within a short period of the meeting started, I found myself driving the bus and uh, <laughs> throwing out ideas on Underground Railroad. Uh, so this is sort of the, not the culmination of what has been going on, but a, a status report on where we are in the Underground Railroad, the museum in Fairfield, Iowa. For those of you who don't know, and I've recently spoke to somebody from Canada when I said Underground Railroad had a blank look on their face without having the history of United States under your belt, a lot of people don't understand it. And a lot of people don't understand it even understanding the history of the United States. Two things we have to get out of the way first off. The Underground Railroad was not underground in the sense of being through tunnels and, and things like that. And it wasn't a railroad in the sense of locomot locomotives and rails. It was a groups of individuals who believed that slavery was wrong or a sin or something that needed to be stomped out, working with other groups of individuals to bring freedom seekers north and eventually into Canada where they would actually have freedom. When this whole thing first started, getting out of a slave state was no guarantee of freedom. You could still be brought back. Um, the earliest part of the Underground Railroad would occur over here in the east with Harriet Tubman working in the areas of Maryland and uh, uh, Delaware bringing people up, eventually getting them into uh, Philadelphia where they could be transported by boat up to uh, Canada. As America spread west, Ohio became a hot spot. Oberlin was one of the, uh, the centers of the Underground Railroad. The Congregationalists were uh, very big in getting people across the Ohio River north to Oberlin and then across the lake into Canada. Harriet Beecher Stowe uh, wrote about <laughs> uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was a, uh, uh, a story of escape from Virginia and Kentucky coming across the, uh, uh, the Ohio River and then into freedom. The Ohio River provided a barrier to freedom seekers. The Underground Railroad provided ferry transportation across the river. Uh, but the, the Ohio River also served as a refuge because the slave hunters wouldn't necessarily be able to easily cross and it made for quicker uh, escape. As people moved west, the ideas of abolition and uh, fighting slavery moved west with them. Iowa had the advantage of having a 200 mile long dry border, no rivers to cross, again, is somewhat of a disadvantage because it didn't hinder slave hunters either. In the 1930s, a fellow by the name of Cecil Turton undertook a study of Iowa and memories of the Underground Railroad. And he was able to put together this map featuring primarily the southwest part of Iowa where slaves would come from Missouri, coming through Kansas, corner of Nebraska, and then moving 
east across central Iowa, but he also recognized that things happened here in southeast Iowa. The town of Denmark was settled by Congregationalists for the express purpose of working with the Underground Railroad. Uh, the town of Salem was founded by the Society of Friends, the Quakers, with the same purpose. Now, looking at the timeline of the fight against slavery, the Missouri Compromise figures greatly into this. Now, I'm not gonna bore people with eighth grade literature and, and uh, history. It, uh, Missouri Compromise was simply, Missouri was allowed in as a state, a slave owning state, as Maine was allowed in as a free state. There was a compromise there and no discussion about it. Missouri would be a slave state. Now, 13 years later, the settlement of Iowa began. People began moving from the east into Iowa and settling. In 1835, Salem was uh, settled by the Society of Friends as an outpost uh, for the Underground Railroad. Denmark was settled in 1836, the same year that Fairfield was. Denmark settled by the Congregationalists and the, the founder sent back to uh, uh, a seminary back east asking for young seminarians to come out and help with the Underground Railroad in Iowa. And a group of them came out known as the Iowa Band and they spread across Southern Iowa, Cincinnati, Tabor, and then even up into Grinnell, Grinnell College was uh, founded by one of those Iowa band members. Looking here, Salem settled first, and then Denmark, and then Fairfield. Now Denmark didn't figure too greatly in the Underground Railroad of Fairfield, but Salem did. Henderson Llewellyn had settled early on as a, a, a Quaker to work with the Underground Railroad. Uh, he worked for several years bringing people north. And again, Iowa had the advantage of having a dry border and the disadvantage because as slaves escaped north and Salem became known, increasingly violent groups of slave hunters would come and harass the citizens trying to capture the freedom seekers. And it became such a problem that the Society of Friends excommunicated Llewellyn in 1847. Llewellyn packed up a, uh, a wagon full of fruit trees and headed west and established the fruit industry that we now know in the Northwest. But Salem was left without Llewellyn, but not left without the Underground Railroad. The next year in 1848, a farmer in Missouri who had 16 slaves had nine of them escape and they fled to Salem with slave catchers right hot on their heels. Uh, it became, there was a standoff. The men from Salem took arms and rescued these nine uh, escaped slaves. Uh, the, uh, the slave hunters went back to Missouri, gathered a band of some say there was a hundred uh, it, was, it was a pretty fierce band of people determined to burn the town of Salem to the ground and get these slaves back. They fortunately, a half a dozen of them were, were ferried uh, out of town. And by the time the slave hunters got here, got there, there was three left. Uh, in order to save the town, the slaves were given up. They were returned to uh, Missouri, but the uh, Mr. Daggs, the, uh, the, the, the person who claimed to own the slaves, sued. And under the uh, uh, Runaway Fugitive Slave Act of 1793, he sued successfully and cost the townspeople of Salem thousands of dollars. Uh, this was the only time, the, the, the uh, 1793 Fugitive Slave Act was very rarely used and is the only time it was used west of the Mississippi. But it put a dent on what happened in Salem. So here we have Good Fairfield. Out of Salem, we had a line of people coming from Salem to Fairfield and from Salem also to Libertyville and then from Libertyville on to Fairfield. Also coming out of the south, out of Kisakwa and through Ebenezer Gould's place in Birmingham coming up north through Fairfield out of Ottumwa from the west, people came in, coming up out of 
uh, Cincinnati, Drakesville, to Ottumwa, and then in. And then the point was to move people north through Pleasant Plain up into Washington, or through Richland up into Washington, and then they would be moved to Muscatine, and either across the river into Illinois, where they had relative safely, safety, but ideally to Chicago, and on a, a steamer across the lake in, and, and up into Canada. So why Fairfield? We did not have the Society of Friends meeting house even. There were, there were Quakers, but not that many. Congregationalists, same thing. There was a congregation, Congregationalist congregation, but they weren't active. What Fairfield had, Masons. Interestingly enough, the Masons. Now, why would I think that the Masons would uh, have anything to do with it? Well, it goes back to one person. Now, the, the people who worked on the Underground Railroad were very quiet. They did not talk at the time about what they did because they were in violation of federal law. First, this uh, 1793 Fugitive Slave Act, and then there was in the 1850s was a stronger Fugitive Slave Act passed. So these people were acting against federal law. Now, Joseph McKemmy uh, came to Fairfield in the 1840s, I'm sorry, uh, along with his half-brothers, uh, James Slagle and Christopher Slagle, Christian Slagle. And uh, the Slagles and McKamies uh, came to Fairfield and settled. Uh, Mc Joseph McKamey and his brother, half-brother James were saddle makers here in town and uh, Christian went on to become an attorney. Uh, James married a, a woman named Cynthia Hemphill. Uh, more about that in a bit, but McKimmy tells the story of being approached by seven men from Fairfield and asked to form an association to fight slavery and to aid in escaping, for escaping fugitives. Clearly, the description of the Underground Railroad to which McKamey delightedly said yes. Still, what does that have to do with, does that have to do with Masons? Well, in 1847, the same year that McKamey was approached by seven men from Fairfield to form this society, seven men in Fairfield formed the Clinton Lodge of the Masons. Ironic. J.L. Myers, oh, I got this. J.L. Myers here went on to become the founding master of the lodge in Salem, Iowa. So we see these seven people. Now, Mr. McKemmy was not the first person they spoke to. He was actually the second person they spoke to. The first person was George Atchison, who also agreed to join the lodge. Atchison was married to Mary Hemphill, which was Cynthia Hemphill's sister. So we have a family connection here, along with the fact that Atchison was the law partner of Christian Slagle. Again, business, family, all tied together. Now Slagle, interestingly enough, was not a Mason. However, he was the founder of the International Order of Oddfellows here in Fairfield. He founded the Oddfellows Lodge, another fraternal organization, similar in, in many ways to the Masons. Now, further connections. The Clinton Lodge chaplain was a fellow named the Reverend L.B. Dennis, a fiery, fiery Methodist minister who spoke against the, uh, the, the horrors of slavery and was very open and loud about it. Uh, he was also a family friend of the Burkett family who were known to be Underground Railroad operators. Uh, he was the officiant at Hannah Burkett's wedding. And he was a good friend of Jesse Burkett, the patriarch of the family. Well, Reverend Dennis, in order to be closer to the fight, in 1855 went to Kansas. Kansas was trying to get statehood, but slavery was up to a vote there. If the majority of the people wanted slavery, it would become a slave state. So to combat this, people like the Reverend Dennis uh, and like-minded people flooded into Kansas to throw the vote against slavery. Well, people in Missouri were not, did not take kindly to that. They wanted a slave state next door. And people 
border ruffians from Missouri would come over and they basically started what turned into a, the Kansas War. Out of the Kansas War, the abolitionists against the Missouri ruffians came uh, John Brown. He was the, the, a leader in the war. Uh, Reverend Dennis uh, had the unfortunates of having his home burned and all of his livestock slaughtered by uh, Missouri ruffians. Now, he wrote back to Jesse Burkett uh, in 1856, telling the woes of the bleeding of Kansas and offering sincere hope that that would, that would not befall Fairfield. So Dennis was well aware of what was happening in Fairfield, probably deeply involved in it. The Burkitts. Now, any of you who have seen the heroes of Fairfield uh, are familiar with the story of Christian Burkett, a young fellow, uh, 10 or 11 years old, working with his parents on the Underground Railroad. They had a home uh, in, in Fairfield, but they rented a small farm up on B Street, probably about where Utopia Park is in that area. And they would have, there was a abandoned slaughterhouse nearby on Crow Creek, which they used as a, a refuge for freedom seekers. They would make their way to the, up Crow Creek to the slaughterhouse. And then one of the Burkett brothers, either Archibald or Christian, uh, would in the disguise of going to the farm to feed uh, uh, livestock, would stop by the slaughterhouse, give food to the, uh, the, the freedom seeker, go on to the farm, and then at dark, bring a horse back, load the freedom seeker on the horse, and they would go north to Pleasant Plain to catch the next station on the, the, the railroad. Um, the Christian Burkett, as an older man, uh, told the story of his last ride on the Underground Railroad in which he failed miserably. A, uh, uh, he got startled, the, the horse jumped, the rider fell off, and uh, it, basically all hell broke loose. But that was his last ride. His parents never asked him to do that job again. But uh, Archie here was a gunsmith. Uh, he made Burkett rifles here in town, him and his uh, brother Christian. Uh, had a gun shop in town. The Burkett rifles are, are a, a fine uh, 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 muzzle-loading percussion uh, cap rifle. Uh, at the museum, to give a pitch to the museum, we have now three Burkett rifles in our possession. Fine, fine instruments. Um, and then the Burkett brothers served as a, a gunsmith. There's an ad from the ledger uh, from 1859 from their, their shop. Archie Burkett learned the craft of gunsmithing from Daniel Mendenhall, this fellow here. Daniel Mendenhall, Mendenhall was a master gunsmith. His guns were recognized all the way to the Pacific Ocean. So Archie was apprenticed to him. Daniel Mendenhall was a mason. His uh, uncle became the, uh, uh, the master mason of the Salem Lodge. Again, you see these connections. Um, he was married to a woman named Susanna Pierce. Now, about shortly after the Reverend Dennis took off to the front lines in Kansas, Benjamin and Rachel Pierce uh, and their sister oh, came, uh, came, uh, came down to, uh, to Fairfield from Newton. Uh, Benjamin and Rachel had been working on the line of the Underground Railroad between Newton and Grinnell across central Iowa, and that was, things were going slow there, and he, like Reverend Dennis wanted to be at the, the, the forefront of all the action. So they moved here and Mendenhall was married to Benjamin's sister. Uh, the uh, uh, Benjamin Pierce, the Pierce house was uh, just over here on 2nd and Adams. Uh, there's now a large white house there that was built after uh, Pierce had moved out. Pierce, when he left there, he built a house on 3rd and Jefferson. This was after the Civil War. He built that house, and that's still standing there. Um, so these people, you see them, they're joined in loosely by religion. They're joined by family. They're joined by association. Uh, and they're joined by business. And this is, this is the 
the, the tip of the iceberg for Fairfield. Now, I, uh, in my research that I'm, I'm doing with the Park Service, I'm looking at people who were in the Underground Railroad that are buried in the cemetery here as a point of showing that we have operators here and they're still in existence. So every, all the people that I've brought up so far are still here in Fairfield out in the cemetery. Now, and they were all, all white folk. That does not mean that there were not black folk in town who were very concerned with the Underground Railroad. James and Nancy Yancey, I love that name, Nancy Yancey. Uh, Nancy was uh, uh, brought to Ohio as a, a child and freed, and she had this thirst for education, and she went to Oberlin College. And while she was at Oberlin, she met James Yancey. They married and moved to Fairfield. Now, Fairfield, as open and caring as it was, a, uh, a brilliant black woman could only get a job as a laundress in this town. And her husband, James, equally brilliant, a marvelous speaker, another a fiery orator, was the local barber. So, but in their neighborhood, and again, I have not located their neighborhood yet, but in their neighborhood, it was well known that what they were doing, they were bringing people in and moving people out. They were actually operators of the Underground Railroad. Everybody sort of accepted that and, and left them alone. Now, Robert Wynn and his wife came to Fairfield in a different way. Robert is the last known person to have traveled the Underground Railroad. He was sold into slavery and Macon, brought into Macon, uh, Missouri, Macon County, Missouri. He had a wife and a child there. And when he heard that he was to be sold south, leaving his family in, in Macon, Missouri, he decided to make his break for freedom in hopes of being able to return quickly and bring back his family. He, uh, his route north is not entirely known. It undoubtedly came through Salem and then Fairfield, Pleasant Plain. And then as he was waiting to ferry across the Skunk River in uh, Washington County, the ferryman informed him that he did not have to run anymore, that he was a free man. Uh, so this was in 1863, probably right after the Emancipation Proclamation is signed. Well, uh, Robert Wynn, on hearing that, came back to Fairfield, where apparently he knew people. He uh, joined the Union Army and went off to fight in the Civil War in the Mississippi campaigns. He was mustered out in Arkansas and then came back through Macon County, Missouri, got his wife and his daughter and came back to Fairfield and raised a fine family here in town. So the, the stories are absolutely incredible. I have, where's my book? I don't know, I was just looking. That's interesting. Yeah, I had to, well, anyway, uh, there is a book written about this. It's, it's, it's that thick. Uh, it's the Who's Who on the Underground Railroad of Fairfield. Ah, there they are, okay. <laughs> ah, gotcha. Let me see your library card. This, <laughs> this, is, this book here, uh, written by Rory Goff, who has done an incredible, absolutely incredible amount of research on the Underground Railroad and the characters. Looking at the, the Underground Railroad, and I was trying to graph this whole thing out, the, the relationships between people, and this is the closest I can come up with. Uh, so you've got church, family, fraternal organizations, at least the Masons, probably the Odd Fellows, and businesses all working together to, uh, for this, this one cause. So then, where do we go from here? The first goal, what the, the Alumni Association came to the museum for and what the museum is here for is to inform the town about our incredible past. It's, uh, it's, it's phenomenal. Uh, and that's, I'm speaking here to a, a large chunk of our town. Uh, our second goal is to get recognized on the National Park Service's network to freedom. That one has not been as smooth, although the Park Service is quite anxious to get us on the network. Uh, there's uh, questions about our, our, our cemetery and our underground railroad operators in the cemetery are our ticket to uh, being informed, being, being part of this network. 
But being a part of the network, we'll be able to work with other Southeast Iowa communities. The idea is to create a, a district of Underground Railroad activity to show how people came from Kiyosakwa to Birmingham using the per Pearson House in Kiyosakwa. Uh, Birmingham, I know, has got structures, and then on into Fairfield, uh, working with the Llewellyn House in Salem, finding locations further north, and getting this, uh, being able to bring people who have an interest along that route so they can see exactly what the freedom seekers went through. Now, so far, we've, uh, we, we've done quite well. Uh, we applied to the uh, uh, Greater Jefferson County Foundation for funds for the stabilization of the Bonifield Cabin. Uh, Bonifield Cabin has no association with the Underground Railroad, except it existed at the same time. It's one of our very few structures that we have that was present at the time of the Underground Railroad. So our goal is to use that as an interpretive site to, uh, to be able to give out information about the Underground Railroad. And then uh, we have a very strong desire to produce a play. I've just given you a small sampling of the cast of characters of this town that participated in the Underground Railroad. There is the desire to develop a play uh, around any of these characters. And the nice thing about these characters, for those who you might be playwrights, uh, is we don't know the words they used. We don't know what they said. We know the actions. So it's a blank slate with the characters uh, put on that. So that's another one of our goals. So the sky is the limit as far as the, Fair, as the Fairfield community can take this. It's, it's up to us. But what do we have right now? Well, I, I'd mentioned the, uh, how the Burkitts brought people up Crow Creek. Um, technically, there is and there are probably people, maybe a fellow in this room who can answer some of those questions a little bit closer about how uh, freedom seekers traveled along the creek systems. Uh, Cedar Creek uh, ran near Salem, came up to a confluence with Crow Creek, and then people could travel along that and then go up Crow Creek into Fairfield to the slaughterhouse to be picked up by the Burkitts. Well, we still have a trail that runs along Crow Creek. It's the Fairfield Loop Trail. Um, and our goal is to have kiosks built at either end and signage along the trail talking about how freedom seekers use trails such as this to, to travel without being seen uh, across the, the landscape into Iowa. So this is a, a ways away. The city's about ready to tear up our, uh, our loop trail in that area to build their new sewer system. But I, I uh, it's all right, it's, it's good, it's good. We need the new sewer system. But uh, I, I think uh, when it comes back, we'll be able to uh, get this, the, the Fairfield Freedom Trail firmly established. All right, well, I wanna thank uh, the Carnegie Museum Foundation Board, first off, for, for, for being there and being able to put this together. The Carnegie, the Working Board, I want to thank all of you folks for, for working along with us. Uh, Parsons College Alumni Association for coming with this original incredible idea to, to look into the, uh, uh, the Underground Railroad in Fairfield. Uh, Mark Schaefer, who's holding down the fort at the museum right now for us. Uh, he's been a, a wonderful source of knowledge. And of course, Rory Goff, the extraordinary researcher I, I still haven't figured out why he's gone through all this work. I didn't go through that work to write my thesis, but uh, it's, uh, and I've done a second thesis now just based on, on his work. But, uh, and, and most of all, I wanna invite, I wanna thank the community for being here, for coming, to, for being interested in the history of your town. And uh, hopefully we'll all be able to go together and develop this out even more. Thank you.